Yeah, I mean, it has been a quite, quite a good experience, of course. Uh, the plan was to climb Broad Peak and K2, and we did it. But the way there was not so easy, and it uh, could have been gone wrong many times to prevent us from scaling summit. So uh, I'm so 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 happy. And I'm also quite happy to go to go home after one month on the glacier here. Ladies and gentlemen, today we have an opportunity to share with you experience of Belgium's one of the most experienced, seasoned and well accomplished mountaineer, Niels Jespers. Niels visited Pakistan this season and he was able to scale ascent to the summit of two eight thousanders in a row and even that without oxygen a big accomplishment. He has become the first Belgian and the eighth mountaineer in the world a mission of scaling two eight thousanders and even that without oxygen. Uh, K2 is uh, the second highest peak of the world and it is supposed to be the most difficult peaks to climb. And uh, Niels was successful in climbing that peak on 28th of July. And before that, um, he was able to ascend the broad peak, which is also 8,051 meters high. And even that we peak, the Neil state without oxygen. Uh, welcome back, Neil, to Belgium. Uh, you have just arrived yesterday, and uh, we are happy to have you in our program. Uh, very warm welcome and heartiest congratulations on this big accomplishment. Um, we know that uh, uh, doing K2 was your childhood dream and you had been trying to uh, accomplish this dream and now you have been successful. What is, what is your experience and how do you feel about it? Uh, well, it, it was never, it was always a dream, but a dream doesn't make for a plan yet. So I never planned to, to climb this mountain just until three years ago after successfully uh, climbing Nanga Parbat. So then it more became of a plan and then I was finally ready or I could finally imagine to uh, also accomplish this childhood dream of climbing K2. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried two years ago. Uh, and then uh, I had a problem with frostbite on my toe, so no success. And this time, yeah, I'm so very happy that it that, that it was successful. Also, because you put a lot of focus and energy in it, and now I feel like I can uh, also more like it's like a relief also to to um, to move forward, you know, because I was so much focused on this one the last years even so then it makes that that makes the, the big meaning of it no it's 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 it can be anything for anyone else but for me it was this mountain and it was like uh, three four years of my life focusing on it so that makes also that why why it's such a why i'm so happy now that that, I, that it was successful and then i can can leave it behind somehow you know i can finish this this chapter <laughs> yeah and uh, what other peaks you have done already, like other than? Uh, yeah, I've I've been climbing my whole life. But if you refer to eight thousand meter peaks, then it's um, Nanga Parbat in two thousand eighteen, and then this year uh, Broad Peak in K yeah. two. Mm -hmm. And other other mountains you have been visiting uh, climbing? Yeah, since I was. 
16, uh, mm -hmm. I went on a youth alpine course with some Belgian alpine club. Uh, and ever since, I spent all my holidays mainly in the Alps uh, when I was uh, young. And then at some point, I was living in Bolivia uh, amongst 6,000 meter peaks. So there I had the experience to, to go to a higher altitude and to gain more experience to climb. Um, and after the 6,000, um, I had like maybe five, four or five peaks. I climbed and then uh, I thought, okay, well, let's move on and see what 7,000 does. So I went to Kantengri, which is a peak in Kyrgyzstan. Mm -hmm. My first and only 7,000 meter peak. And after this was successful, then uh, I imagined climbing an 8,000 meter peak. And then I selected Naga Parbat for this because it used to be my nickname um, with the Youth Alpine Club. So everybody got like... Like with Boy Scouts, they got a nickname and mine was Naga Parbat. So that was my choice of this mountain to be like first 8,000 meter peak. So, um, yeah, that's it. And Naga Parbat is also supposed to be killer mountain, one of the very difficult mountains. So what is in K2 that makes it so difficult to climb, which is supposed yeah. to be the ultimate mountain? So what makes it so difficult? Yeah, it's mainly the altitude. So if you don't use oxygen, then the altitude is the most challenging. Um, the climbing as such, uh, it is steep, it is nice. I enjoyed very much the Black Pyramid, like a little bit of rock climbing, but it's it's not on sea level, it's not a big, big challenge, you know, but it's the altitude, yes. And then compared to Naga Parbat, the other mountain, um, there was a very, very... Um, selective piece uh, like the, the Kinshofer wall is very famous on Nanga Parbat route it's on 6,000 meter altitude so it's a bit lower on the mountain but it's very very steep and very long so such kind of a climb did not uh, was not part of the route of Abruzzi on K2 mm -hmm. so it's so you can always say what is most difficult yeah it just depends I mean um, but for K2 it's obviously the for me it was the altitude yes yes and during your expedition, was there any moment that you can recall as the most difficult and the most, you know, a fearful moment in the entire expedition? Well, difficult and fearful is different. So difficult was um, as yeah, mainly the last 200 meters on K2. It's mm -hmm. It was so slowly. We progressed very slowly. It took us many hours to do to, to, to the last... Uh, 200 meters of altitude so uh, and then fearful yeah was the descent actually because then we um we had some rock falls um in the black pyramid so this one was um um the most scary because then i have to had to put my backpack on top of my head to protect not that any stone hit it but just uh, there was a it was very close actually so that's that was yeah, the most scary and also very difficult. It, it looks like easy or not very uh, mentionable, but but just the process of being in a too small tent. I'm quite tall, so the tents are a bit small for me. Um, being there, getting out of the sleeping bag, getting ready, making some water, making some breakfast. All these things are also difficult. I mean, everything is difficult at altitude. So, so I also want to mention these things that seems to be normal and, and and easy but yeah that's also mentally also it's like a challenge to to get out of the sleeping bag and to get ready for the climb you know but once you're like dressed and fully equipped and the backpack is ready yeah then then it's also enjoyable to to climb and and, and whatever but all these small things takes a lot of effort as well yeah and like when you climb without oxygen and you have all these other Risks, risks like falling of rocks and other things. And I mean, you are actually in the death zone when you are above 8,000 meters and without oxygen, like risks are even more. Mm -hmm. So it's a very um, uh, candid and uh, very curious question that what goes on in the mind of a climber, a mountaineer, when they are in this kind of risky situation in a danger and 
do they think about their families? Like sometimes we are, when we are in a difficult situation, we think about our, our moms or dad or uh, our children or maybe whoever is close to us. Or sometimes uh, when the weather is harsh, we are thinking of just a good, nice cup of hot coffee or something. And are there some thoughts that goes on or you're just fixed on the challenges? Uh -huh. No, I was, uh, yeah, it was mainly, again, on this very high altitude, like above 8,300. Then at some point, yeah, because it was, I was so tired, then you start thinking, oh, oh is this, is this uh, wise to continue? Um, is this, um, yeah, is this, then I felt a danger. I, I mean, really, then I just realized the danger of, of being just being there, even not climbing, just being there at this altitude, and then I imagined like, oh, if something now goes wrong, then it's very wrong. So then I thought about that, but then I thought also when I I thought about giving up at some point as well, but then I thought about my family and friends instead, and their firm belief in me and the confidence, and also the the sponsors and the partners of the project. And I didn't feel the pressure of them. I could easily go home without summit. So I didn't f suffer any summit fever, I think. Mm -hmm. But then because of all this support and all this, yeah, the, the, this three years of preparation for it, that gave me the strength to continue. Also to think of my friends and family who just believed I would, I would be able to do it. And then I continued. Yeah. It's so uh, what part of, training you would say is the most important in giving you this kind of confidence and continue with all the hazards around yeah i i mean i found out that only hugo and myself my climbing partner me climbed without oxygen all the others with so mm -hmm. i also knew if i want to do such such thing without oxygen I need a very good preparation and training is part of it. So that was very motivating. I mean, and then I always use an hypoxic machine, which is like a machine that takes oxygen out of the air and mm -hmm. blows it into a mask. So then I was training, for example, rowing on the, on a rowing machine with mm -hmm. this mask. I was for eight weeks at home. I was sleeping in an, in this hypoxic tent. So the machine connected mm -hmm. to a tent and sleeping there. So then I, I knew that I, I mean, I couldn't do any better or more preparation in, in this aspect, in the, in the oxygen part. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I was, uh, I was running a lot uphill, downhill. Um, I live in a flat country, but um, the, then there are solutions for it. I mean, I used also a building to mm -hmm. staircases up and down uh as a preparation it's very boring but it's also part of the mental preparation because sometimes on the on the mountain it's also a long day and and and, and an antiguous job so mm -hmm. then you also train your mind to stay to stay easy and to say like oh whatever if it's if it's four more hours of climbing yeah, okay we'll just do it <laughs> yeah. yeah so you uh, grew up in a flat country and in, in flat lands. Why did this uh, mountaineering thing uh, came to your mind to pursue it as your uh, hobby or I would say? Once hobby? we were on a, on a family trip in France and then we did a lot of sports and one of them was rock climbing. Mm -hmm. And then the year after my father found like the announcement for this youth alpine course. Mm -hmm. So it was actually a suggestion to me and I said, well, I don't know yet. Uh, I'll ask some friends at school if they want to join me or not. Mm -hmm. No one wanted to join me. Well, in the end, I, I went to this course alone. Um, and yeah, ever since it became a passion and, uh, and, and I took every opportunity, for, for example, to live in Bolivia between the mountains, but also Alps. It's not the same country, but it's very accessible, you know. Um, some people live close to the mountains, but there's no infrastructure. But in, in Alps, you, in the morning, early morning, you drive to Chamonix. And in the same evening, you can sleep on the glacier below Mount, Mont Blanc on 3,000 meter altitude. So in that sense, well, it, 
it's it's quite accessible. So within within the day, you're in the middle of the mountains, although it's quite a journey, but it's the roads are good and uh, there is some cable cars going up the mountain and that's a big difference with with all other mountains in the world actually i think in that sense the alps are quite unique to or to be so accessible um from the lowlands uh, you talk about uh, accessibility and other infrastructure so in pakistan how do you find these facilities for mountaineers who want to climb these really high magnificent peaks what is your take on that yeah it's it's part of what attracts me and i think many other climbers as well no the it's it's it that's it's actually opposite it's just the opposite of what you can imagine in europe it's mm-hmm. so very much inaccessible although uh, i also spoke to some people who came for already 30 years ago and also mm-hmm. this year and they can compare of course and then they say like in the first time i had to go there it was even maybe a 10 or 15 days trek from Dasu uh, and then gradually the road moved to Ascole and even me just comparing 2019 to this year uh, in two years time the road has extended um, from Ascoli and now um, already to Jula uh, there's a jeepable road which makes for just only only four days trek while it, it used to to be seven from Escole or, or six. So slowly it's, it's, it's getting more accessible, I think. Um, but still, the, the glacier will, will remain there. So this will not change. Well, it will still be at least some days of hiking in. But that's already a big difference. And it's it changed. So and then, but of course, the road as such is also very difficult because of landslides. Often it's blocked and, and these kind of things. But I think it's it's double when when we see that the road is extended. I mean, it's also part of the attraction no? for for tourists and for mountaineers mm-hmm. like us to go to such wild wild environment. You um, talked about the road, but are there other facilities like the licensing and other support ah. structure, the porters and other people? you find them like quite up to the mark everything um, very supportive or yeah of course the local outfitters company and and now i speak about uh, my experience with lila peak expedition yeah it's very good i mean they just arrange everything i'm not used i us- usually i travel on my own and i arrange all these things myself but in pakistan it's on the one end is not not possible the permit process mm-hmm. and all the, and the porters it's not possible to arrange yourself as far as possible, they, they make sure everything goes smooth. Everything that's in their hands was good. But of course, sometimes something happens when the road is blocked. They can't, they can't, they can't arrange it. But yeah the, the, yeah, the whole permit thing and passport checks and, well, I don't like too much. <laughs> There's quite, quite a lot of, uh, of these things now on the, uh, on the, on the route too, too many times. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, for example, for for um, for hiking, um, I mean, I, I know a lot of friends who would like to do this hiking on the Baltoro Glacier, mm-hmm. um, but, um, and they are independent, experienced hikers, so mm-hmm. they can just carry their tent, sleeping bag, food for even seven up to ten days, no problem. But it's very hard to find, because you need them a permission for hiking and also there should be some guide involved mm-hmm. but then the problem starts because then there's a guide and the guide needs a cook and the cook needs a porter and the porter needs a donkey and before you know you you're you're on a trip with many people and it's very expensive in the end i mean for a regular trekking it's it is like maybe two three thousand dollars because because you have to hire all this stuff um and that makes it very expensive but for me, I'm still looking, if I want to recommend this trekking to some friends of mine, I'm still looking for a solution, how you can convince just one local guide, because it's obliged, mm-hmm. um, who who want to share this experience with, 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 the, with the foreign tourists, 
to just carry everybody one backpack, a very like uh, basic food supplies and, and mm -hmm. just go for it. And that's, I, I was looking around any kind of hiking guide I spoke to and always they say, no, no, we need a porter, we need a, we need, we need a cook. And then you start mm -hmm. and then you're off with, with a group of 10, 10 staff and then it becomes slow and, and it becomes too expensive for, for many people. That's, that's, that's my experience and, and a different point of view you know, from the foreign tourists and from the, the local culture or the local habit, how to, how to organize these things. Yeah. So do you see any kind of uh, cooperation between Pakistan and Belgium regarding trainings or, you know, making things uh, more attractive to tourists or um, more Belgians going uh, to for mountaineering in Pakistan? Yeah, um, training wise, yeah, we we only we don't have mountains, so we we also have only maybe ten mountain guides, uh, official mountain guides in Belgium, and they do their training in the respective. Uh, countries mm -hmm. like Switzerland or France or Germany mm -hmm. so we don't have much of this experience I think and then especially for the 8000 meter peaks not so many people in Belgium are are involved uh, in this uh, and um, so that's a bit difficult but on the other hand I mean there's always space or room to to promote the climbing and especially the trekking i mean there's more mm -hmm. even more people maybe interested in in hiking on the baltoro glacier and on gondogorro and, and or any any other place in pakistan you know so in the, in that sense yes i i always when i do um like a speech or a presentation then i always try to to convince more people to also go there um i wanted to take my family uh, last time but in the end they didn't engaged to to go on the trip mm -hmm. so yeah i mean promotion i think is very important and to spread the word and i'm i'm part of it i always try to to give a good impression uh, of the country because that's my impression a good one um, while for people who have not been in in pakistan they generally have like a rather poor or bad impression of, of the country because of the news and the media but all, every, everybody who has actually been in the country, uh, they are very, all, all people I meet, Belgian people, they are mm -hmm. very enthusiastic and they will always recommend, I think, to, to go there. If you like adventurous traveling, let's say, or wild country uh, with wild nature, yeah. Yeah. Are there many Belgians who are interested in mountaineering, the, particularly the young people? Uh, do you see many Belgians uh, coming towards this side? In general, uh, yes, yeah, there are many, actually there are many alpine clubs you would not expect, mm -hmm. but in Flanders and also in Wallonia, um, every area has an alpine club and they have, um, but okay, okay, it also includes uh, indoor climbing and sports climbing and rock climbing, of course, and then Part of these people also go to Alps, but not, of course, not every, not, not the majority. Mm -hmm. um, and in my club, for example, we have specific youth uh, alpine mm -hmm. course, um, and it's not the most popular one. But there is there is quite a scene of people uh, who are climbing, actually. Yeah. Okay, and does the Belgian government support uh, climbing and mountaineering? Um, not very much. Um, the sports associations, uh, the federation is somehow supported uh, for their work. So they have some employees who can organize the climbing competitions and all these kind of things. So the, the like the structural, uh, the organization is, mm -hmm. uh, is supported by the government, let's say, but individuals uh, in general, not. Uh, well, I have to I have to say that from the Climbing Federation, they also give me some financial support mm -hmm. on before it, the first uh, attempt I did. Mm -hmm. um, so in did so if if you apply with a project which is somehow it has some official criteria, but mm -hmm. there is some, but it's rather limited. I mean, it's no, yeah, 
it's not not very much yeah. okay and one important question uh, who was your coach who was your coach yeah yeah Hrit, Hrit Feris is she's a friend of mine mm-hmm. and i asked her at the very beginning before my first attempt two years ago mm-hmm. i i asked her to coach me and more in the sense of the project i mean and sponsoring because mm-hmm. i'm not very experienced or i was not very experienced to find sponsors and it was mm-hmm. needed naga parbat i paid all myself but without sponsors i could not i was not able to go next year again for another expensive uh, trip like this so then i asked her and she was coaching me on it i did all the all the work but she was giving advice and pushing me a little bit how to deal with uh, a website and media and 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 how to try to find the right people uh, for sponsoring and yeah this is also a very important aspect yeah because you have to find like good sponsors it's uh, an expensive venture yeah. you have to do um and again again many most many times people are if they're a bit older they might find some have some money more, more money you know if people are a little bit mm-hmm. older but yeah for me climbing without oxygen i think it's now for me the best time to do this i'm now 35 years old so it, it will not get any better after this you know yeah 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 so, so then it's a matter of having enough money as well so then then you yeah you have to go with with sponsors yeah yeah and just to wrap up our conversation like uh, you had been visiting pakistan many times and you have many friends over there um what is your impression of pakistan as a country and people of pakistan just to if you can share some yeah of your memories and things it's amazing and it's not very fair i mean if if pakistani people come into belgium they're not welcomed so warmly as uh, on the other hand uh, how i was welcomed in pakistan was amazing um you can go to any town or village in the street and people will talk to you and ask if you need any help and yeah it's it's amazing i mean <laughs> i always compare like indeed in belgium also many pakistani people but it's different you know how how the belgian people treat foreign people in pakistan it's uh, yeah they're just too, too friendly and for example in one village on the route from askardu to askole um i i met one man just because i was in the street and then he was i was invited for tea um now for for this occasion uh he insisted that i would visit his village to celebrate together but but we were very late so then he still insisted that he gave a cake and some dried fruits just i would i was just 5 minutes there but he insisted that i would take it to skardu and to celebrate there so i mean it's it's amazing yeah and you visited islamabad in karachi also briefly you uh, like those cities islamabad yes some days uh, that's of course very different uh, karachi i did not visit um i just spent there a few hours in the airport and then i flew back to islamabad mm-hmm. um so i can't really compare like i only know the northern areas now mm-hmm. and but i did take some time uh, obviously to 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 know the other valleys and to be in the village mm-hmm. and also first time i was in shimshal uh, herding the sheep to the summer grazing fields and to, going together with uh, with the with the people from the village so that was really also i also that's also part of the the climb or yeah the expedition i like no to get to really know the people stay a bit more time on one place than just to fly around <laughs> and and take some pictures you know so i really enjoyed also sharing real life real life with uh, some people from the villages yeah okay Nils thank you very much you arrived only yesterday and i know it was a very hectic and very difficult uh, trip that you have done but um heartiest congratulations that you have achieved so much to 8000ers without oxygen and 
well, probably first Belgian to have done this and the eighth mountaineer in the world. And thank you, you kept sharing your uh, pictures and videos when you were there. And it was like a big connection that you maintained while you were there. And we uh -huh. all very much liked it. And many people in Pakistan and Belgium were able to see you like, and they were like updated almost um, uh, very regularly about your progress. And people were actually uh, making good wishes and praying for you and the kind of comments they were leaving on the um, channel. The, everyone uh -huh. was like, you know, actually okay. waiting to listen the very good news. Thank and, you very much. And thanks for following and for commenting. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And we hope to see you achieving more in your future endeavors, whatever you want to climb and wherever you want to go and whatever pursuits you have in life. So wish you all the successes in your life. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining. Okay. Thank you.